11 Christ and his kingdom Revelation 19, 1 20, 15 Drawing near John's vision of the last days turns a corner here, when the King of Kings returns to rule and reign in righteousness. What are you most looking forward to about Jesus' second coming? Your response here The Bible makes it clear that we will be judged and rewarded according to our works. How does knowing Jesus will come again affect how you live each day? Your response here The context How will the world end? There are as many answers to that question as there are doomsday prophets, futurists, and scientists. Some speculate about collisions with giant asteroids. Others worry about nuclear conflagration. Still others fret over possible extraterrestrial invasion or the extinction of the human race due to pollution or disease. But those who study the Bible know that history is, literally, his story. God is, and always has been, sovereign over the events of earth. The New Testament book of Revelation repeatedly reminds us of this truth. The day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to reward his followers and to punish his enemies. Few passages in all of Scripture are as majestic and powerful as Revelation 19.20. It begins with the sound of rejoicing over the defeat of the evil world system called Babylon. It ends with the Battle of Armageddon and Christ's glorious Second Coming events that mark the close of the Tribulation. Then we see the binding of Satan, Christ's thousand-year earthly kingdom, Satan's final rebellion, and the Great White Throne Judgment. In the end, Jesus Christ will make all things right. Alleluia! Keys to the text The Millennium, this is the thousand-year reign of Christ over the earth, 20, 2, 7. There are three main views regarding the duration and nature of this period, 1, premillennialism says Christ will return before the thousand-year reign and sees this as a literal thousand, year period during which Jesus Christ reigns on the earth, in fulfillment of numerous Old Testament prophecies, for example, P.S. 2, I.S.A. 11, 6, 12, 24, 23, Hose. 3, 4, 5, Joel 3, 9, 21, Amos 9, 8, 15, and Zech. 14, 1, 11. Premillennialism says that Christ will return after the events of the Great Tribulation but before the final judgments and the establishment of the new heavens and new earth. Using the same general principles of interpretation for both prophetic and non-prophetic passages leads most naturally to premillennialism. Another strong argument supporting this view is that many biblical prophecies have already been literally fulfilled, suggesting that future prophecies will likewise be fulfilled literally. Two. Postmillennialism says Christ will return after the thousand years and understands the reference to a thousand year period as only symbolic of a golden age of righteousness and spiritual prosperity. It will be ushered in by the spread of the gospel during the present church age and brought to completion when Christ returns. According to this view, references to Christ's reign on earth primarily describe his spiritual reign in the hearts of believers in the church. Postmillennialism essentially teaches that the Church, by preaching the Gospel, will Christianize the world and usher in a worldwide era of peace commonly called the Millennium. Following this Golden Age, Christ will return and eternity will begin. 3. Amillennialism understands the thousand years to be merely symbolic of a long period of time. This view interprets Old Testament prophecies of a millennium as being fulfilled spiritually now in the Church either on earth or in heaven, or as references to the eternal state. But, using the literal, historical, grammatical principles of interpretation so as to determine the normal sense of language, one is left with the inescapable conclusion that Christ will return and reign in a real kingdom on earth for a thousand years. There is nothing in the text to render the conclusion that at a thousand years is symbolic. Never in scripture when year is used with a number is its meaning not literal. Unleashing the text read 19, 1 20, 15, noting the keywords and definitions next to the passage. Revelation 19, 1 20, 15, NKJV, 1 After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. After these things, v. 1, this is a time key. 
meaning after the destruction of Babylon at the end of the Great Tribulation, and just before the kingdom is established, ch. 20. This section bridges the Tribulation and the Millennial Kingdom. Great Multitude, v. 1, Probably Angels, since the Saints join in later, vv. 6 7, c 5, 11 12, 7, 11 12, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ prompts this outburst of praise Alleluia, v. 1, the transliteration of this Hebrew word appears four times in the New Testament, all in this chapter, vv. 1, 3, 4, 6. This exclamation, meaning praise the Lord, occurs frequently in the Old Testament, cps. 105, 45, 106, 1, 111, 1, 112, 1, 113, 1, 117, 1. Five reasons for their praise emerge, 1, God's deliverance of his people from their enemies, v. 1, 2, God's meeting out of justice, v. 2, 3, God's permanent crushing of human rebellion, v. 3, 4, God's sovereignty, v. 6, and, 5, God's communion with his people, v. 7. 2 For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Judgments, v. 2, Saints long for the day of judgment, c. 6, 10. Godly people love righteousness and hate sin, for righteousness honors God and sin mocks him. Believers long for a world of justice, and it will come, v. 15, 2, 27, 12, 5. 3 Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Smoke rises, v. 3, this is because of the fire, c. 14, 8, 11, 17, 16, 18, 18, 8, 9, 18. 4 and the 20, 4 elders and the 4 living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. 20, 4 elders, v. 4, best understood as representatives of the church, c. 4, 4, 4 living creatures, v. 4, a special order of angelic beings, c. 4, 6. These compose the same group as in 7, 11 and are frequently associated with worship, 4, 8, 11, 5, 9, 12, 14, 11, 16, 18, 5 Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great, small and great, v. 5, all distinctions and ranks are to be transcended. 6 And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Omnipotent, v. 6, or Almighty, used nine times in Revelation as a title for God, cv. 15, 1, 8, 4, 8, 11, 17, 15, 3, 16, 7, 14, 21, 22, the great praise of the multitude sounds like a massive crashing of waves 7 Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Marriage of the Lamb, v. 7, Hebrew weddings consisted of three phases, 1, betrothal, often when the couple were children, 2, presentation, the festivities, often lasting several days, that preceded the ceremony, and, 3, the ceremony, the exchanging of vows. The church was betrothed to Christ by his sovereign choice in eternity past and will be presented to him at the rapture. The final supper will signify the end of the ceremony. This symbolic meal will take place at the establishment of the millennial kingdom and last throughout that thousand, year period, c. 21, 2. While the term bride often refers to the church, as it does here, 
it ultimately expands to include all the redeemed of all ages, which becomes clear in the remainder of the book. 8 And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Righteous acts of the saints, v. 8, not Christ's imputed righteousness granted to believers at salvation, but the practical results of that righteousness in believers' lives, that is, the outward manifestation of inward virtue. 9 Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Those who are called, v. 9, This is not the bride, the church, but the guests. The bride doesn't get invited, she invites. These are those saved before Pentecost, all the faithful believers saved by grace through faith up to the birth of the church, Acts 2. Though they are not the bride, they still are glorified and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. It is really differing imagery rather than differing reality. The guests also will include tribulation saints and believers alive in earthly bodies in the kingdom. The church is the bride pure and faithful never a harlot, like Israel was, see Hos. 2. So the church is the bride during the presentation feast in heaven, then comes to earth for the celebration of the final meal, the millennium. After that event, the new order comes and the marriage is consummated, see 21, 1 2. True sayings of God, v. 9, this refers to everything since 17, 1. It is all true the marriage will take place after judgment. 10 And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Fell at his feet, v. 10 Overwhelmed by the grandeur of the vision, John collapsed in worship before the angel, C1, 17, 22, 8. Do not do that, v. 10, C22, 8, 9. The Bible forbids the worship of angels. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, v. 10, the central theme of both Old Testament prophecy and New Testament preaching is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 11 Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Heaven opened, v. 11, the one who ascended to heaven and had been seated at the Father's right hand, Hebrew. 8, 1, 10, 12, will return to take back the earth from the usurper and establish his kingdom, 5, 1, 10. The nature of this event shows how it differs from the rapture. At the rapture, Christ meets his own in the air, in this event he comes with them to earth. At the rapture, there is no judgment, in this event it is all judgment. This event is preceded by blackness the darkened sun, moon gone out, stars fallen, smoke then lightning and blinding glory as Jesus comes. Such details are not included in rapture passages, John 14, 1 3, 1 Thess. 4, 13 18 White Horse, v. 11, in the Roman triumphal processions, the victorious general rode his white war horse up the Via Sacratu, the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. Jesus' first coming was in humiliation on a colt, Zech. 9, 9. John's vision portrays him as the conqueror on his war horse, coming to destroy the wicked, to overthrow the Antichrist, to defeat Satan and to take control of the earth. Faithful and true, v. 11, true to his word, Jesus will return to earth, c. 3, 14. In righteousness he judges, v. 11, c. 20, 11, 15. Makes war, v. 11, this startling statement, appearing only here and 2, 16, vividly portrays the holy wrath of God against sinners. God's patience with sinful, rebellious mankind will be exhausted. 12 His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. 
his eyes were like a flame of fire, v. 12, nothing escapes his penetrating vision, so his judgments are always just and accurate, c1, 14, 2, 18. A name. No one knew, v. 12, John could see the name, but was unable to comprehend it, c2 cor. 12, 4. There are unfathomable mysteries in the Godhead that even glorified saints will be unable to grasp. 13 He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. A robe dipped in blood, v. 13, this is not from the Battle of Armageddon, which will not have begun until verse 15. Christ's blood, spattered garments symbolize the great battles he has already fought against sin, Satan, and death. The Word, v. 13, only John uses this title for the Lord. As the Word of God, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the express image of his person, and the final, full revelation from God. 14 And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Armies in heaven, v. 14, composed of the church, v. 8, tribulation saints, 7, 13, Old Testament believers, and even angels. They return not to help Jesus in the battle, they are unarmed, but to reign with him after he defeats his enemies, 20, 4. 15 Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Sharp sword, v. 15, this symbolizes Christ's power to kill his enemies, 1, 16. That the sword comes out of his mouth indicates that he wins the battle with the power of his word. Though the saints return with Christ to reign and rule, they are not the executioners. That is his task, and that of his angels. Rod of Iron, v. 15, Swift, righteous judgment will mark Christ's rule in the kingdom. Believers will share his authority, c2, 2, 27, 12, 5. Winepress, v. 15, a vivid symbol of judgment, c14, 19, 16 And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his thigh, v. 16, Jesus will wear a banner across his robe and down his thigh with a title emblazoned on it that emphasizes his absolute sovereignty over all human rulers, c. 17, 14. 17 Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, supper of the great God, v. 17, also called the battle of that great day of God Almighty, 16, 14, it will begin with an angel summoning birds to feed on the corpses of those who will be slain, see Matt. 24, 27, 28. God will declare his victory before the battle even begins. The Old Testament frequently pictures the indignity of carrion birds feasting on human dead, p.s. 79, 2, isa. 18, 6, g. 16, 4, 19, 7, 34, 20, Isaac. 29, 5. 18 That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. 19 And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. His army, v. 19, Zechariah describes this army of the Lord as all the saints, 14, 5. 20 Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone beast was captured, and the false prophet, v. 20, in an instant, the world's armies are without their leaders. The beast is Antichrist, 
c. 13, 1, 4, the false prophet is his religious cohort, c. 13, 11, 17. Cast alive, v. 20, the bodies of the beast and the false prophet will be transformed, and they will be banished directly to the lake of fire the first of countless millions of unregenerate men, 20, 15, and fallen angels, c. Mat. 25, 41 to arrive in that dreadful place. That these two still appear there a thousand years later, 20, 10, refutes the false doctrine of annihilationism, c. 14, 11, isa. 66, 24, mat. 25, 41, mark 9, 48, luke 3, 17, 2 thess. 1, 9. Lake of Fire, v. 20, the final hell, the place of eternal punishment for all unrepentant rebels, angelic or human, c. 20, 10, 15, fire. Brimstone, v. 20, c. 9, 17. These two are frequently associated with divine judgment, 14, 10, 20, 10, 21, 8. 21 And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Birds were filled with their flesh, v. 21 All remaining sinners in the world will have been executed, and the birds will gorge themselves on their corpses. 20 1 Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Bottomless pit, 20 1. The place where demons are incarcerated pending their final sentencing to the lake of fire, c. 9, 1, 2. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, laid hold, v. 2. This includes not only Satan but also the demons. Their imprisonment will dramatically alter the world during the kingdom, since their destructive influence in all areas of human thought and life will be removed. Dragon, v. 2, likening Satan to a dragon emphasizes his ferocity and cruelty, c. 12, 3. Serpent of old, v. 2, a reference to Satan's first appearance in the Garden of Eden, gen. 3, 1, 6, where he deceived Eve, c. 2 cor. 11, 3, 1 Tim. 2, 14, a thousand years, v. 2. This is the first of six references to the length of the Millennial Kingdom, CVV. 3 7. 3 And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. Bottomless pit, V. 3. All seven times that this appears in Revelation, it refers to the place where fallen angels and evil spirits are kept captive, waiting to be sent to the lake of fire the final hell prepared for them. Released for a little while, v. 3, Satan will be released so God can make a permanent end of sin before establishing the new heaven and earth. All who survive the tribulation and enter the kingdom will be believers. However, despite that and the personal presence and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, many of their descendants will refuse to believe in him. Satan will then gather those unbelievers for one final, futile rebellion against God. It will be quickly and decisively crushed, followed by the great white throne judgment and the establishment of the eternal state. For and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The souls of those who had been beheaded, v. 4, these are tribulation martyrs, c. 6, 9, 18, 24, 19, 2. The Greek word translated beheaded became a general term for execution, not necessarily a particular method. His mark, v. 4, c. 13, 16. 
tribulation martyrs will be executed for refusing the mark of the beast. Reigned, v. 4, tribulation believers, along with the redeemed from both the Old Testament and New Testament eras, will reign with Christ, 1 Cor. 6, 2, 2 Tim. 2, 12, during the thousand-year kingdom. 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, v. 5, the bodies of unbelievers of all ages will not be resurrected until the great white throne judgment, vv. 12 13. First resurrection, v. 5, scripture teaches two kinds of resurrections, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation, John 5, 29, C. Dan. 12, 2, Acts 24, 15. The first kind of resurrection is described as the resurrection of the just, Luke 14, 14, the resurrection of those who are Christ's at his coming, 1 Cor. 15, 23, and the better resurrection, Hebrew. 11, 35. It includes only the redeemed of the church age, 1 Thess. 4, 13, 18, the Old Testament, Dan. 12, 2, and the Tribulation, v. 4. They will enter the kingdom in resurrection bodies, along with believers who survived the Tribulation. The second kind of resurrection, then, will be the resurrection of the unconverted, who will receive their final bodies suited for torment in hell. 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Blessed, v. 6, those who die in the Lord, 14, 13, are blessed with the privilege of entering his kingdom, c. 1, 3. Second death, v. 6, the first death is spiritual and physical, the second is eternal in the lake of fire, the final, eternal hell, v. 14. It could exist outside the created universe as we know it, outside of space and time, and be presently unoccupied, c. 19, 20. 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison Satan. Released, v. 7. He is loose to bring cohesive leadership to the world of rebels born to the believers who entered the kingdom at the beginning. He is loose to reveal the character of Christ rejecting sinners who are brought into judgment for the last time ever. 8 And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Gog and Magog, v. 8 The name given to the army of rebels and its leader at the end of the millennium. They were names of ancient enemies of the Lord. Magog was the grandson of Noah. Gen. 10, 2, and founder of a kingdom located north of the Black and Caspian Seas. Gog is apparently the leader of a rebel army known collectively as Magog. The battle depicted in verses 8 and 9 is like the one in Ezekiel 38, 39, it is best to see this one as taking place at the end of the millennium. 9 They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Beloved City, v. 9, Jerusalem, CPS. 78, 68, the capital city during Christ's millennial reign. The saints will be living around the city where Christ reigns, CISA. 24, 23. Fire, v. 9 frequently associated in scripture with divine judgment of wicked men, 2 Kings 1, 10, 12, 14, Luke 9, 54, 17, 29. 10 The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Deceived, v. 10 just as his demons will entice the world's armies into the battle of Armageddon, Satan will draw them into a suicidal assault against Christ and his people, 16, 13, 14. 
tormented day and night, v. 10, c. 14, 11. Continuous, unrelieved torment will be the final state of Satan, fallen angels, and unredeemed men. 11 Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Earth and the heaven fled away, v. 11, John saw the contaminated universe go out of existence. Peter described this moment in 2 Peter 3, 10 13. The universe is uncreated, going into non existence. Great White Throne, v. 11, nearly 50 times in Revelation there is the mention of a throne. This is a judgment throne, elevated, pure, and holy. God sits on it as judge, c4, 2, 3, 9, 5, 1, 7, 13, 6, 16, 7, 10, 15, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, c21, 5, 6, 12 And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. Standing before God, v. 12, in a judicial sense, as guilty, condemned prisoners before the bar of divine justice, there are no living sinners left in the destroyed universe since all sinners were killed and all believers glorified books, v. 12, these books record every thought, word, and deed of sinful men all recorded by divine omniscience, see Dan. 7, 10, the verse that is the source of this text. They will provide the evidence for eternal condemnation, c 18, 6, 7. Book of Life, v. 12, it contains the names of all the redeemed, c 3, 5. Judged according to their works, v. 12, their thoughts, Luke 8, 17, words, Matt. 12, 37, and actions, Matt. 16, 27, will be compared to God's perfect, holy standard, Matt. 5, 48, and will be found wanting, Rom. 3, 23. This also implies that there are degrees of punishment in hell, see Matt. 10, 14, 15, 11, 22, Mark 12, 38, 40, Luke 12, 47 48. 13 The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Death and Hades, v. 13, c1, 18. Both terms describe the state of death. All unrighteous dead will appear at the great white throne judgment, none will escape. All the places that have held the bodies of the unrighteous dead will yield up new bodies suited for hell. 14 Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 15 And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 1. What reasons are given for heaven's rejoicing in 19, 1 5? Your response here too, why would the redeemed of heaven be glad for God's judgment? Your response here. Verses to consider, ISA. 9, 7, G. 23, 5, Rev. 16, 7, 3, What is the marriage of the Lamb? Your response here, verses to consider, John 14, 1, 3, 2, COR. 11, 2, F. 1, 4, 5, 22, 24, 4. How is the second coming of Christ described by John in chapter 19? Your response here. Verses to consider, Matt. 24, 27 31, Acts 1, 9 11, 17, 31, 5. Compare and contrast the judgment of Satan with the reward of the faithful witnesses during the thousand years. What will God do? 20, 1 6. Your response here 6. Describe what will happen at the great white throne judgment. Who will be judged, and how? Your response here, verses to consider, Matt. 11, 20, 24, 
John 5, 22 29, 12, 48, Acts 17, 31, Rom. 2, 5, 16, Hebrew. 9, 27, 2 Pet. 2, 9, 3, 7, Jude 6, Going deeper the prophet Micah foresaw the time when God would reign over all. Read Micah 4, 1 8. 1 Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. 2 Many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 3 He shall judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. 4 But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. 5. For all people walk each Indiana the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. 6. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted, 7. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation, so the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. 8. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Exploring the meaning 7, how does the prophet Micah describe the coming millennium time of peace? Your response here 8, what will draw people to God's mountain? Your response here 9, read 2 Samuel 7, 12 16. What promise did King David receive? How is it fulfilled in Jesus? Why is the premillennialist view necessary for the fulfillment of this prophecy? Your response here truth for today all attempts to equate this glorious reign of Christ over the whole earth with any past event or with the church is utterly foreign and contradictory to the clear eschatological teaching of scripture. There is no way this text can be fulfilled except by the universal reign of Jesus Christ over the whole earth as the prophets had for so long predicted. Reflecting on the text 10 how does this glorious picture of Jesus returning and making all things right encourage you? Do you still have questions about Christ's coming reign on earth? If so, write them out here. Your response here 11, which millennialist view of Christ's thousand, year reign do you support? Why? Your response here 12, what hopes and fears do the truths of these two chapters bring to the surface in your own soul? Your response here 13, List the names of friends, loved ones, neighbors, classmates, etc. Who have not yet been confirmed as written in God's book of life. Ask God for the opportunity to use your relationship and example to point these people to Christ. Your response here personal response write out additional reflections, questions you may have, or a prayer.